The sea, sand and castles are all part of the many attractions of Pembrokeshire, a prominent feature of the county, defences that still stand guard over the landscape. Iron Age hill forts dating from over 2,000 years ago, such as Rubbockston Wraith and Castell Hentlis. Then there are the massive walls and keeps of Norman castles, once formidable deterrents against attack from any quarter. There were raids by the French on the English south coast in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. In 1405, a large force of French mercenaries under Owain Glyndwr landed at Milford Haven. The Haven sheltered waters forming an extensive natural deep water harbour, long used as a departure point for Ireland. Henry VII landed here from exile to found the Tudor dynasty after the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. It appears that no attempt was made to build permanent fortifications for the Haven's protection until 1580, when two blockhouses were built on opposite sides of the entrance to the Haven, where today all that remains of the East Blockhouse are these crumbling remains, though the 19th century replacement for West Blockhouse is still a feature of the northern shore of the estuary. The need to provide the Haven with adequate defences took on a much greater importance with the start of the Napoleonic Wars, and this provision was given increased urgency following the French landing at Fishguard in 1797. A royal dockyard for the building of warships was founded at Milford Haven, but soon moved in 1814 to what became Pembroke Dock. It was the need to protect this new rapidly expanding dockyard, together with the advent of steam-powered warships, that resulted in plans being drawn up for new forts and batteries these being constructed as part of an extensive building scheme between the years 1840 and 1875. Well-conceived and massive defences were constructed at a number of points to give coverage by guns with a range of over 1,000 yards. An enemy ship coming up the haven would in turn come under fire from east and west blockhouses, then Thorn Island, Chapel Bay, Stack Rock, South Hook, Hubberston, Popton Point, Pater Battery, and the two Martello Towers at Pembroke Dock, as well as the guns from the defensible barracks on the hill above. Forts were built at Scoviston to the north and St. Catherine's Island, Tenby, to guard against attack from overland, though things did not go smoothly. Will, I trust, excuse my bringing to your Lordship's notice the very defenceless state of Pembroke Dockyard, which is at present not even secure from a coup de main. In the event, the forts never fired a shot in anger and became known as Palmerston's Follies, after Lord Palmerston, whose directive had caused some of them to be built. Many now stand empty and abandoned, whilst others have found new uses. Together they show the care that went into their planning and construction and stand as a unique and complete record of 19th century defensive systems. The Front Street Martello or Gun Tower that you are inside was built between 1848 and 1851 to defend the north and east sides of the dockyard with walls between five and nine feet thick and made of brick with limestone and granite. Designed for 33 men and one officer, it had a 12,500 gallon water tank, a magazine to hold 194 barrels of gunpowder and was armed with three large smoothbore muzzle-loading cannon on the roof that fired cannonballs weighing 32 pounds for a distance of over 1,000 yards, able to smash solid oak three feet thick. There were also three 12-pound howitzers inside the gun tower itself. Handling gunpowder and firing the guns was hard and dangerous work. There had to be regular practices for the volunteer artillerymen from the dockyard to ensure that they could be ready for action when needed and could fire and reload the guns quickly to keep up as rapid a fire as possible. Today there's still a volunteer militia, and as part of the Gun Tower's continuing education program, hands-on experience of visiting parties of children. We've got the gunpowder out from the magazine, we've opened the top of the barrel, so now we're going to make up the charges to put in the cannon so that the cannonball can be fired out. Right, OK, so we'll fill up the charge, Miranda. Pour the gunpowder in the bag. Careful, don't spill it. All the way in. There we are. 
and now Steve can take that up to the gun up on the top, and we can fire the cannon. Prepare to load! Load! Prepare to fire! Fire! Whilst on the outskirts of town in the well-tended military cemetery, there are other remains, including those of some of the many who served in the dockyard and forts and who now lie here at rest. Developments in guns and construction of ships continue to pace. Guns getting bigger, more powerful, and with much greater range. Ships became faster, longer, and more heavily protected with armor. The now obsolete guns in the tower were removed in 1880. Forts along the haven were equipped with the new rifled heavy guns, and gunnery practice became an important activity in the area and remains so today. During the First World War, the dockyard continued to service the Royal Navy and was an assembly point for convoys, as it was to be again just 25 years later during World War II. <laughs> Brigadier Cliff Goff served in the forts between the wars and recalls what happened when they supplemented their meagre food rations by shooting rabbits and keeping them in the fort's magazine. And the only problem was that when the duty boat came down on a Monday or a Friday, if there was anybody of any importance on the boat, the rabbits had to be cleared very rapidly from the magazine. And how we used to know whether there was anybody of any importance on the boat. We had friends amongst the crew on the duty boat who would fly the ensign on the boat in a certain fashion so that when the boat appeared from around, uh, came into the open, having called in at Chapel Bay, we used to take a quick look at it. And if there was anybody important, the, uh, there was a recognized drill for clearing the magazine and having a quick shave in the 20 minutes that would elapse before the boat got to Watting Bay. In 1926, the Royal Dockyard closed and was taken over by the Royal Air Force as a base for flying boats. Known affectionately as PD, it became home to the famous Sunderland, one of which is preserved at the RAF Museum, Hendon. <laughs> Two of the large hangars still dominate the skyline and are now designated Grade 2 listed buildings. During World War II, the dockyard and town suffered many enemy air raids. The gun towers were rearmed with Lewis guns on the roof against enemy aircraft. What do you think that is? The dockyard itself managing to escape without too much damage though nearby large oil storage tanks were set alight and burned for 18 days. Over 200 houses were destroyed during the war. Despite the defeat of old enemies and long years of peace between us, the past should be remembered and the role of this part of Pembrokeshire's proud military heritage. <laughs>